I'm speaking to our guests today virtually due to, of course, social distancing. They include Professor Chris Saldana in the Woodruff School of Mechanical Engineering here at Georgia Tech and Samuel Graham, school chair of that school. And we're here to talk about the work that they're doing to fight the spread of COVID-19. Welcome to the program, Chris and Sam. Thanks for having us. Thank you. So, wow, you know, just really amazing what's happening in, in the world today. And anybody who's kind of tracking things has seen actually Georgia Tech in the, in the news a lot. And a lot of that work is due to you, Chris, and you, Sam, as well. And so maybe the best place to get, to get started is talk a little bit about the work that you've been doing, uh, maybe in face shields to start, because I know there's other, other work. You talk a little bit about the work. How did it come to be? How did, how did you get going? Uh, and the kind of impact that it's had already. Chris, you want to take take a, take a stab at that? Sure. Thanks, Steve. Uh, thanks for the introduction. Uh, so, uh, as as you were mentioning, uh, there's a lot of effort that's been going on here at the Woodruff School in the area of face shields. Uh, face shields are uh, some of the more critical PPE or personal protective equipment that hospitals need to uh, protect even more critical pieces of equipment like your N95 masks and respirators uh, from contamination. So uh, when we, we got together as a group, a large group of faculty across the college uh, under leadership of, of Sam, as well as uh, Dr. Susan Margulies in, in BME, looking at what are some of the areas that we need to get active in and what are some of the areas that are immediately important to the healthcare workers at Emory and other uh, hospitals in, our, in the Atlanta area. Uh, face shields was one of those one of those areas. Um, so uh, we had these uh, these discussions and touch points with with Susan and, and the other clinicians at Emory, uh, where we rapidly got on this problem. Uh, it actually happened very uh, closely timed with the shutdown here on campus, uh, when uh, uh, we we decided to um, you know put people on uh, work from home, telework, and shut down the, the facilities. Uh, so. Uh, myself, a couple other students, in fact, members got critical access here to the Institute. In particular, here in the Woodruff School, we have the Flowers Invention Studio as well as other prototyping facilities where we, we knew this was going to be critical for us to actually develop some solutions for the, the clinicians here in Atlanta on, on a quick order and quick pace. Um, so we, we got that uh, ability to access that space. Um, we started interfacing very quickly with clinicians at Emory University Hospital as well as with uh, with Children's Health Care of Atlanta to start looking at what are some designs and, and approaches uh, that would be useful in the area of face shields. Uh, so we started with uh, um, one of my colleagues, Dr. Saad Balma, on uh, open source designs. So this is an example of one open source design that um, the community had put out. Uh, and then when you when you look at these kinds of designs, the, the challenge really is that these are really built for um, you know the the ones the the fuse in terms of uh, producing components for your friends, your neighbors, and things like that. Uh, but when you look at, and we were talking with the clinicians here at, in Atlanta, it was really about, it was going to be, the need was going to be in the order of tens of thousands in the matter of days, or millions in the matter of weeks across this region, across Georgia, and across, across the U.S. it would be tens of millions. Um, so we started asking the question, how do we take these open source designs and then um, not only start producing components here to satisfy the local need in, 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 in an immediate way, but also build something that could be scaled and with, with Sam and when, with other people here in our departments, uh, Stephen Sheffield and our technical staff, we've been able to engage with companies uh, like Siemens, uh, Delta Airlines, uh, Dart, uh, and uh, Coca-Cola to actually start looking at how do we uh, produce this for the national need uh, in, in that same order. So it's been, a, it's been a wild ride. We've been able to get uh, the students engaged. They've had a lot of uh, great exposure to um, this rapid design problem, working with stakeholders, trying to keep an honest view of their designs and, and really responding and dropping the things that aren't critical for uh, what is needed in the, in the healthcare workers' environment. Um, so it's been a, a very rewarding experience in that regard, and it's folks like Sam that have helped us knock down barriers to actually get things done quickly. And so, Sam, you know, uh, sometimes we're criticized at moving at the pace of academia uh, you know, thing, things can sometimes take a long time to do stuff, but I've found this, I know that this all happened really quickly. So from the time that, um, that it, it sounds like Chris, there's some of these meetings took place and they said, hey, let's focus on face shields. From the time that happened till the time of the first face shield was delivered, 
Can you talk about um, how quick that was and what it took to make that uh, happen to connect all the dots? So I, I think, you know, when you bring together really good people that are, are motivated, if you give them the resources, they're going to run with it and make things happen. And that's really what happened in this case. So I remember being on a, a call using uh, Microsoft Teams. It was through a Slack uh, channel we had started getting together. And there was a discussion about making the face shields. And I remember, I recall that I had this uh, roll of PET film in my in my lab. It was about a hundred foot roll. And I said, hey, let me run to the lab and get it and give it to these guys. You have to start feeding them with resources. And I think by the next day, you know, the next morning, uh, Chris had called and said, hey, we had X number that were already made. And by the end of the day, I think you guys had 120 of these things made. And so it didn't take that long. So the the thing that I think you, you find here in the Woodrow School, which is really, really good, is that We've had this culture for the students of rapid innovation and providing resources to students. And now that the students weren't in the spaces and they were empty, it allowed the faculty that had that same drive to get in there uh, with a few of the students that were remaining in order to do that. So I, I was very, very happy to, to see the quick utilization, the quick turnaround. I knew that the, the need was dire. Uh, the other thing is that I, I think that was really important is that we started out with 3D printing and looking at a few other uh, techniques and listening to people like uh, Susan Margulies from, from BME, when she told us the, the needs that one local hospital can go through 2,000 of these in one day, it immediately said, you guys need to think about this problem at a different scale, and you need to think about it using different techniques. And I think that's one of the things that caused us to turn from 3D printing to move to other scalable techniques very early on. And the other thing that did is it made me think about what are the resources that are, are needed in order to produce, you know, 2,000 a day multiplied by X number of hospitals in the area. And I think one of the resources I was able to use that people may not have thought of was that I called it development. I, I said, development, you have connections with industry. This is what I need. Connect. Can you connect me with this company? Can you connect me with, with that company? And using our development officers here at Georgia Tech led us to some of the first breakthroughs to have some of the big donations of materials that came in to allow us to scale very, very quickly. Yeah, and so and so all that, geez, all that happens just within a matter of days. And so I'm really curious again to because I think there's a lot of a lot of our listeners are high school students and other engineers. And so, so you produce the first 150 face shields. And so what do you do next, right? Are they the right design? Are they the wrong design? So you got those 150 and uh, what do you do next? You know, it's a, Chris, it's yeah. a very, yeah, it's a very interesting uh, question. Typically in a development, design development life cycle, you'd, you'd have days to iterate, weeks to iterate with your design team uh, and then eventually develop a next prototype and then go back out there. So I think when we first produced this, as Sam was saying, I think we, we had this 100 that we produced on, on a Thursday. I showed it to a doctor on a Friday that came here on campus from Children's Healthcare of Atlanta. And I, I, when you look overall at the end of it, we were done by Monday in terms of our final design. It really needed to be at that pace. And in the span of time over that weekend, um, what, what I came to understand is unique about this problem with COVID-19 and, and the immediacy of the challenge that we were faced with is that you would have to go through the typical design iterations you would have to go to to get through a final prototype, but do it in the matter of 72 hours, 48 hours. That was the time scale that we're working with. Uh, and only by talking with the stakeholders, for us, we're conveniently, we have this great relationship with Emory Hospital um, where we can get this rapid feedback from the clinicians and listen to them and, and really identify with what are the challenges that we face, is what, are the, what are the challenges that they face. So over that weekend, we had students uh, meeting the clinicians directly, uh, clinicians coming here on campus into the Flowers Invention Studio, trying on different things, making those small adjustments that in a typical design and manufacturing uh, environment might take a matter of weeks, but doing it in a matter of, of hours or minutes, depending on, on how we were approaching it. Uh, and, and I think for, for us, you know, when I, I remember showing this, this, uh, this prototype, it was, it was actually this one with a, with a shield on it. And then we ended up with, this is the final one here, um, that uh, that you know, we iterated on. The uh, I remember showing the first design to the clinician, saying, "Okay, we'll get something ready by the end of the weekend." And it says, "No, you need it done now." Mm -hmm. uh, and and it was really those kinds of uh, um, urgencies that we were getting from the clinicians that were, I think, very impactful for not only for myself but for the students that were in the room listening to the need. 
Um, I think one of the, um, the Children's Healthcare of Atlanta doctors actually said, she said point blank to us, said every minute that you spend designing, people are going to be dying. So you have to you have to iterate quickly, and you have to get to that endpoint because you need to turn this over to not only our manufacturing resources here at the institute, but also manufacturing resources that Sam has been able to muster with companies like Siemens, Dart, uh, Coca-Cola, and, and you know other folks that are getting engaged in the fight for uh, this particular effort. Wow! So you're like four or five days into the whole thing, you've got the final design and you have doctors and hospitals saying we need thousands so you're ready right i think you're ready so how do you get how do you how do you start to meet that that demand sam so one of the big things of, of meeting the demand and again is uh, finding help so where, where you need help that's where you go and look and so we're fortunate to have other groups on campus like uh, the georgia tech research institute some of the other maker spaces uh, volunteer to provide additional machinery so that way we can you know cut materials and start making uh, the headbands and the face shields but in addition to that uh, to go to an even larger scale I was able to turn to uh, our friends at Siemens and uh, when you turn to a large company like that they're used to producing things on scale and what I mean by that it's not the the hundred that we produce in the first day they, they can produce thousands in a day and so they're used to doing this and so you turn to those experts and say, help me scale. And luckily, we had uh, people like Barry Powell from Siemens that came alongside of us and said, I'll help you find the vendors. They uh, also invested, they took some of their money to help find additional resources here in Atlanta and actually pay uh, some other vendors to cut materials for us. And so we were able to go from producing, you know, say 100 in a day to producing uh, a few thousand. And so this is something that, again, finding the right partnerships and, and building on those is something that, that was able to help us to go from the small amount that we could do to something that was much larger that could meet the needs of the, of the doctors. And I, you know, and I know Siemens has been a fantastic partner uh, at Georgia Tech for, for many years. And I'm, and I'm kind of going back to details. So Siemens doesn't make face shields, right? And so I'm curious about what if you know, what do they do internally to, uh, you know, modify their equipment, modify their manufacturing processes, you know, to get to that thousand? Is that easy? Is that difficult? You know, they presumably didn't have face shield manufacturing equipment. So how do they, how do they internally move that quickly to then scale up? So I'll, I'll mention a few things that I think was very important to this. And number one is that when Chris and his team, when they designed the, uh, the the face shield, they designed it so that it would be very, very easy to fabricate and very easy for the doctors to use. And so it didn't require very, very expensive tooling in order to do this. And so when you go to a company like Siemens or Delta Airlines or others that could, can make these shields, it's something where uh, they don't build these face shields, but they have all the tools that are necessary, or Siemens itself also had relationships with suppliers that they could pull in that could easily help us make these. And I think that was a key feature is uh, designing something that was simple, that was very effective, and something that was ready to be scaled, mass produced by very, very simple means. And so Siemens was able to say, we don't make these today, but we, we buy into the story, we understand the need. And just by telling them the, the, the need that, hey, one hospital goes to 2000 of these a day, and that this is going to impact lives, that they bought in and said, let us help. Um, a few other companies I also want to point out that were very instrumental very early on is Georgia Pacific. They donated uh, quite a bit of material for our early designs. And we also had DuPont. DuPont donated material as well as Coca-Cola. And so by none of these companies make face shields, except for DuPont. Uh, and so by telling them what the need was, getting them to buy into the vision that we had, I think that also uh, you know played into the fact that they, they believed in what we were doing and believed in the mission of what the doctors were doing and that, that brought them along. So Chris, we talked about, you know, what takes place in the first four or five days. And I'm really, you know, here we are now, what, three weeks later? This is uh, maybe four weeks later. We're recording this on uh, April the 21st. And um, so where are we now? And uh, what's for, free, for face shields, what have, what have you guys, been able to deliver, and what do you think is going to happen in the coming weeks? So, so it's been a yeah, it's been a wild ride these last three weeks or so, and 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 uh, uh, 
the way that we tiered our approach to this problem here in mechanical and with our, our colleagues across the different hospitals was to start fulfilling the need using the resources here at Georgia Tech. Sam had mentioned work with Georgia Tech Research Institute and some of their, their fabrication services, our own fabrication services here in mechanical engineering. So for the first week or two, we were producing uh, face shields on the order of thousands, tens of 10,000, I think is where we, where we basically got to, where we were donating those, those face shields directly to the hospitals here in the Atlanta area. Um, while we were doing that, uh, we were spinning up resources here, working with companies like Siemens to, uh, to, to work on the volume problem. Uh, so while we were you know, trying to fill this demand on a, a, a local level with whatever resources we had, we were spinning up this larger effort where now Siemens has, uh, uh, through, through Georgia Tech actually, uh, contract with the Georgia Emergency Management Agency, GEMA, which is the, the, uh, the state level uh, uh, organization, the analog of FEMA at the federal level, uh, to produce 100,000 face shields. So that's been going on for the last uh, two weeks. They've been producing, I think, they're now at a, a, a clip or a, a rate of about 10,000 per day in terms of kitting up uh, for shipments to the, um, the local GEMA warehouse here in the Atlanta area. Um, and those are gonna be distributed across um, uh, local hospitals. Uh, besides that, uh, other contracts have come in for those same uh, channels. Uh, and right now, what we're looking at is, uh, as we speak, maybe I think three and a half weeks after this, or four weeks after this effort started, about a quarter million uh, on the book for uh, this particular design uh, that, that we've been producing in connection with Siemens and other companies like Delta, uh, the Global Center for Medical Innovation, and, and a couple other folks. Um, besides that, this has already touched, I think, uh, a transcended not only our, our academic departments here in the, the Institute, but other universities. We've gotten uh, uh, you know, various kinds of data points where universities like Texas A&M, Clemson, and other schools around the world are producing these designs now that were seeded here by, by students here in, in mechanical engineering. Um, and then aside from that, companies that are even affiliated with us that are producing these designs. I think yesterday we got a, a call from, or a, an email from Kia Motors that was producing on the order of uh, 4,000 of these per day for uh, hospitals that they're donating. Um, so in this short amount of time, it's been a, a rapid effort that's really made an impact in terms of volume. Uh, over the next uh, three to four weeks, I know that we're landing other contracts that are associated with uh, a larger efforts for face shields. As more of this information gets out there, we're getting contacted by hospitals in different, different states that, that have these needs that there, clearly, the need isn't fully satisfied if you, if you look at what's happening and you're still getting, like I think we were on the phone yes, last week with someone that needed 50,000 in, in Tennessee. Um, so it's those kinds of numbers that are gonna still be coming in and, and it's clear that there's still a need that we need to satisfy. You know, we, and so far we've talked a lot about the face shields, but I know there's many other things uh, happening beyond just the, the face shields. And so, Sam, if you want to touch on a few of those, and maybe we can uh, dig into uh, one of those uh, as well. You want to kind of paint the broader picture of it's not just face shields, it's a whole lot more. Yeah, so again, I think the key here is that as, as engineers, we're, we're always interested in solving problems. And the, the nice linkage that we have into the insight into these problems is with Susan Margulies and Emory University, where we learn a lot about their operations and things they're having uh, challenges with. And so anything that can protect the doctors and the medical personnel, whether they're uh, doing uh, putting tubes into the patient or taking them out, or they're working with COVID uh, treatments, even people they're not sure if they're sick, we need to be able to protect uh, the people that are healthy around them. And so there are uh, other types of uh, protective equipment that we're designing uh, that includes uh, basically these uh, clear boxes that will uh, basically create an enclosed space around a patient to help contain uh, any sort of viral contamination that would come out. We call these uh, Emotec airway uh, boxes. And so uh, Chris will probably tell you a little bit more about those. There's uh, other aspects that we're looking at as well in terms of how to do air purification. And so working between chemical engineering, mechanical engineering and Emory, how do you create uh, filtration sources that last much longer than the ones that exist today? How can you use uh, light sources? So uh, there's UV light sources that are known to kill viruses. And so how can we make them very, very effective so that doctors can utilize them as they're working and, and have them last for a long period of time? And so there, there's a lot that's happening in this space in terms of 
protection that would go around a patient, protection for the doctors, uh, and uh, additional things in terms of looking at decontamination. There's other aspects that are looking at that liquid. So how do you uh, replace uh, the current liquid decontamination uh, systems that they use in terms of wipes in the hospital with, with new sources that can be utilized. And so there's a lot of work that's going on with um, uh, chemical companies as well as even distilleries now turning to make decontamination liquids that can be used in hospitals. And so we have teams of people here at Georgia Tech that are working with them on those, on those projects. Wow, um, just, just amazing. You know, Chris, uh, Sam talked a little bit about the, the boxes, I think intubation boxes, is that the right term or have the, has the name evolved? But the, um, I've seen a little bit about that. Can you, can you tell folks about what that is and then where it stands, where it's headed? Sure, you know, again, as Sam was saying, I think it's that connection with, uh, with Emory University through the biomedical engineering program that's been excellent. Uh, we saw an open source design for uh, what was called an intubation box, but better probably better described as a airway box because uh, it protects uh, both during the intubation process as well as the extubation process where you're taking someone onto a ventilator and taking them off of a ventilator. Uh, but we made one of those for Emory University uh, Hospital. They trialed it uh, and then we, we started getting feedback and, and, and then we got immediately connected with their anesthesiology teams, their emergency department teams that have to do these intubation and extubation processes to actually protect the healthcare worker. Uh, we've been working over the last, uh, so while those face shields are ramping down in terms of the development side and working on the high volume manufacturing side, we started innovating here in the, uh, in the Flowers Invention Studio on these, on these airway boxes. Uh, so we, we started working with these two Emory clinicians on uh, looking at okay, what is happening in the operating room, the intensive care unit and the emergency department uh, in terms of what are the hazards that are exposed to the worker. Uh, so during intubation and extubation, what happens is uh, you're, you're inserting various instruments into a patient's airway to get them hooked up on a ventilator. Uh, and as, as they're doing that, natural reactions would occur where, uh, for example, a, a patient might cough or might release the aerosolized versions of, of COVID in the, in the room. Uh, and it's extremely hazardous because of the uh, known uh, you know, uh, ability of COVID to infect, infect uh, various people just by the aerosolized particles themselves. Um, so there's not many viruses like that. Uh, there's uh, tuberculosis as an example, but tuberculosis isn't such a big problem here in the United States at the moment. Um, so uh, there's not really any PPE for these kinds of procedures. So this is a, a brand new product that needed to be developed in short order so that it could be used in these different spaces. Uh, so we, we started working with these, uh, with, with these two clinicians at Emory on a design that um, folds flat, because when you're in the operating room or the ICU, those are very dynamic environments, just like the emergency department, where you need to be able to have equipment that doesn't take up such large room. Uh, when you think of the typical static boxes, that's a very that's a challenging situation. So mm -hmm. as Sam was alluding, we developed a folding box, and I'm actually sitting right on the production line for this folding box right now here in the uh, IDEA laboratory, which is a, an Autodesk laboratory, uh, where we've had students, uh, a new set of students, because we can't demand all the time of all of our students on, on, on all these projects. We rolled in a new set of students here to to rapidly design this, innovate with the healthcare workers. And it was, again, a very similar story where we had healthcare workers coming here on campus to look at our designs, to give us feedback. Uh, and, and I think what I remember is, uh, was, we're just over here, just on the other side of the room, um, one of those anesthesiologists had come in here and started breaking down, talking about uh, you know, her, her colleague getting affected by COVID. They had to intubate her, their colleague because they, they, they became exposed to the virus through the operating room. Um, so, that lit a fire under our students because you know they can see the immediate impact of what they're working on in the in the healthcare uh, in the healthcare workers' uh, lives. So we developed some prototypes over the span of a week. They immediately started getting used for intubation and extubation processes at Emory. Uh, and now, uh, you know, through 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 people like Sam, we've been able to engage large companies. Uh, Siemens in that same facility where they're producing face shields now have an assembly line for intubation boxes. So they're working right now in a, an order for Emory that's 200 boxes in size, where they're immediately, I think we had our first delivery on Friday, uh, which is uh, three or four days ago, three days ago. And the, the doctors were literally putting them into their cars to bring to the hospitals uh, that are part of the Emory system. So that'd be Emory Decatur, Emory St. Joe's, uh, Grady Hospital, and all the other hospitals in the Emory system. So 
it's a, again a, an, another story where we have this great innovation space here, this prototyping space in the Flowers Intervention Studio, and we're able to um, meet a need that is immediate uh, for healthcare workers. And so all those boxes right now are being uh, being manufactured on campus, or you've you you have uh, partners to work on that as well. I'll uh, I'll talk a little bit about that. We uh, we definitely have have partners. Um, so so GTRI is is partnering with us to help. But again, our friends at Siemens uh, have come through and and they're helping to build 20 to 30 of these boxes a day. And so again, we're very very thankful for uh, for their help. And uh, what we're able to do is uh, work with hospitals, obtain the material. Uh, you know, Chris's team has the design. One of the things I do want to mention that is fairly unique about the design is that it helps to control some of the airflow. So Chris and, and the team did a, a lot of testing to look at where air might flow through these boxes and to make sure that there was some protection for, for the doctors. And so that was a second level of, of things that, that we were able to do in, so, in sort of trying to prove or, or go through some validation that it would be useful in the hospital. But yes, uh, between uh, Georgia Tech, which is producing, as well as Siemens, we're, we're kidding these things up and, and taking them out to, um, to the hospitals. Um, what, one of the things that I, I do want to go back and, and sort of reemphasize the, the, the interest in these boxes and, and what doctors are facing, um, I recall that we had a phone call one day, and it was, it was a Sunday. And it was a Sunday, probably around 3 or 4 uh, p.m. And, you know, you, we had a, a full team of doctors from a local hospital on a call with us explaining to us the urgency. And I think if we had boxes literally that day, they would have they would have come to our houses to pick them up. They, they, they needed boxes to go intubate, to do intubations the next morning. And one doctor even explained it's not just the COVID patients that you think of in the um, in the say the emergency room, but they're also labor and delivery where they're having to deal with mm -hmm. the delivery of a child as well as uh, COVID uh, COVID mothers, and and they they needed those desperately. And so these are the stories that you know. So I, I recall that you know my daughter was born in intensive care, and so when I think of those kinds of stories, it makes me say whatever I can do to help doctors in these positions, I'll, I'll do what I can. And so I, I think from that point of view, again, as as you hear what they're going through and you hear them talk about what they're facing, it makes you want to do more as much as you can to help them. Yeah, just, just amazing. And, you know, I think the, you know, here we're talking about, you know, kind of the process of taking these, you know, the manufacturing, but I think the, the, the parts in which I've been involved with where, you know, Chris, one of your, you know, some of the, the TV spots are out there and someone will contact me directly hey, I have a doctor, I know a doctor at Grady who needs this or hasn't gotten this. And in, in 10, feels like 10 seconds being able to connect uh, to you, Sam, or to Susan. And I think, uh, and very, very quickly, um, you know, work on the problem at that scale, on the individual, on the human scale. And so it's not just, you know, engineers working in the background on a design and, and getting it to a manufacturer that the kind of impact you're having because of our network and because of, of, of who we get to work with, that impact is direct on individual people. And I know you must have, you know, dozens or hundreds of those stories. And part of me wants to kind of hold on to those stories because those are, you know, those are the things that our students are gonna remember. And that's kind of what I wanted to move towards as students, you know, what do you, you know, Talk about the experience that the, that the students are getting, um, the things that they're saying, or what you think the impact of all this has been on them. I, I think we have excellent students. Uh, you know, when we when they caught wind of what was going on, they were, I mean, we had more volunteers than we, we could bring into the space. I mean, the, 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 the reality of this particular problem of COVID uh, compared to, I think, you know, people compare it to World War II where you could get in the factory and everyone can, can produce things together to, to actually make a difference for that effort. It's a lot harder in COVID because you, you, you have to implement social distancing. You can't have 50 people in a room working on something because of the, the inherent danger of that. Uh, but when, we, when I, we started reaching out to students that wanted to get engaged with, hey, there's this need, we have to be able to um, get prototypes to doctors. You know, there was there was more volunteers than you could imagine. Uh, but the students that we did get in the space, you know, it, it, they were extremely motivated. 
we spent, and not only students, but technical staff as well. We had uh, um, people that uh, typically don't come in on the weekends, come in and, and work 16 hour days to actually kick out prototypes for the doctors. And especially after they, they got to speak to those frontline healthcare workers and, and hear the, you know, the challenge that they face, it, it just motivated them more. And, and it was really incredible. Um, so, you know, the, the rapid maturation of not only seeing a design process go all the way to volume manufacture in the matter of one week is, is incredible, not only for the student's perspective, but also, you know, for example, on these intubation boxes that we're working on now, uh, one, of, one of our doctoral students uh, designed the box and actually is work, worked with Siemens to set up the assembly line and the quality documentation and all that. So captive set of engineers uh, that have been in the workforce for dozens of years listening closely to our graduate students on how do you how do you take and implement this design because because it's really that that shortened timetable that you needed to to realize that on so you need to talk to the person that designed it and 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 not only it's not only just a one-way street where the student's able to inform them on the design but also to look at the design and say can we can we make this substitution or can i make this change is this absolutely needed um so it's that kind of i think uh, um uh, unique experience that the students that have been able to get engaged have been really benefiting from. Um, aside from that, we've also had undergraduate students get engaged. Unfortunately, undergraduate students can't come on campus with, uh, um, with the rules that we have in place for uh, obviously mitigating the hazards that we have with COVID-19. Uh, but we've been able to engage with students to work on virtual kinds of problems. So for example, on the face shield effort, um, when we were going through volume manufacturing on this particular um, uh, product, uh, natural questions that come up with, uh, uh, with a, a manufacturer might come can I replace the shield or replace the, the, the body of this device with something else, a different material that might be in greater supply? Um, and those are very challenging questions to, to answer without having to do the prototyping. But we have simulation capabilities. So we had a team here in the Flower that did finite element simulations. And actually, they were talking with the team out of NASA JPL on can we use Ultem instead of uh, polycarbonate? Uh, so, so there's been a great engagement, not only of people here uh, students and staff and faculty here in the in the being able to actually actually access the prototyping space, but also students that have gotten engaged on the the greater engineering problem that we're facing. Um, so it's a uh, it's been I think a great experience for them, and I've been really happy to be a part of that. A, a lot of what you've been hearing, you know, on, on the news is you know um, the world's never going to be the same. You know, there's some fundamental things about what we do how um, what we do um, are, are just going to change. And Sam, I'm really curious about, based on what it is you've experienced, um, how do you think we're going to change? How do you think the university or a place like Georgia Tech that can really, really contribute in not just small ways, but in huge ways? Um, as I said, we don't, we don't normally produce you know, face shields and deliver them to hospitals on the order of days. But now we're doing that. I'm really curious, um, how do you think we'll, we'll change? What, what, what will come out of this that will make Georgia Tech a different place? That's, a, that's an interesting question. And uh, you know, it, it's hard to, to say exactly what the future is gonna hold, but the things that I've learned that I, I'm walking away from this experience with is that, you know, again, small design teams that are seated with the right people and given the right seat resources, they're gonna make an impact. And so I think that I could see coming out of this a permanent interaction between our designers and our engineers with doctors at Emory, doctors at CHOA, doctors at you know, Piedmont Hospital, the local hospitals here. And I think we're gonna be working on uh, not just the, the rapid problems that need you know, a turnaround in a few days, but what is really the future of medicine gonna look like? You know, we're talking about now going to telemedicine, which people have been working on for a while, but I think there are people like uh, manufacturing engineers like Chris Saldana, and there's other people that are in materials, other people that are in robotics that may not have thought about what, what's their role in the future of medicine. And I think we're gonna see more people coming together to figure out how to solve these problems, not just engineers sitting on this campus, not just the medical personnel sitting over at Emory, but doing it jointly. And so I think that's one of the things I, I see that's gonna be new. I think we're also gonna look at you know, ways that we do research and, uh, and how, to, how to bring teams together. I think this has been a sort of a uniting experience on campus. You know, we have people from the College of Sciences, people from College of Engineering, people from, 
you know, other schools that are coming together to look at these kinds of problems and provide their input, and they're all valuable. And so I, I think this kind of uh, inspiration is going to be seen and it's going to live on after uh, COVID is, is, is in the history books, but we're going to be able to, to live off of this and, and make new progress. And, and Chris, as a professor who teaches, this is not your day job. <laughs> your, your, your day job is teaching students in the classroom and advising graduate students and doing some pro team projects. How do you think, what have you learned and how do you think this is going to change uh, your career and how you view it and what, and, uh, what, what, you, what you're going to do? How, how's it going to affect you? So in, in those moments where we were working on this rapid design problem, it really, well, on the teaching side, it really made me think of, wow, this is going to be a great case study uh, for our students. I teach a class called ME 2110, which is our uh, a creative decisions and design class that you go through structured design processes, teach, teach students how do you work together on a team to actually solve a problem. Uh, and, and that's exactly what this was. I was sitting in, uh, in, uh, together with these clinicians and some manufacturers working through design down select which is a structured process by which you look at the merits of each design and, and actually pick the preferred designs. And, and I, was, uh, I was sending pictures of, of these, uh, uh, the charts and, and things like that, the tools that we were going through to my class, saying that, hey, even though that you're away from campus, know that this is happening right now. And, and uh, I look forward to incorporating it into my, uh, into my lectures for um, the fall semester. I think it's going to be a great uh, connection point to what the students are learning here on campus, to what really is happening in the real world. Um, and then besides that, on the, on the research side, as Sam was saying, I think that, uh, you know, typically in manufacturing, the way that, and that's what my, my research area is, you, you know, we look at a, a triad, you're looking at cost, quality, and speed, and usually you pick two and, and you have to sacrifice one. Uh, and I think in, in what COVID has taught us and, and what, uh, you know, future manufacturing will be uh, for, for, uh, for all of us, We'll be also looking at immediacy because that's not typically something that we think of in, in discrete manufacturing. Usually you have time to produce a product and iterate it with your stakeholders. But the threats that we have in front of us, whether they're, they're in healthcare or in defense or in energy, it'll really be this unique dimension of immediacy where maybe it becomes more of a pyramid instead of a, a three dimensional space that you, you, have, you can work with. So I think that is something that I look forward to um, engaging with in the future. Um, and I think it's the resources here at Georgia Tech really enable us to do that through rapid prototyping, rapid design, and, and working with stakeholders like in the healthcare sector that we have in Emory, Piedmont, and Children's. So, the, so Chris, to follow up, so you had said cost, quality, and speed. And, and you only get right. to pick, normally you only get to pick two. You got to compromise the third. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. So High quality. It's going to take a while. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yes. And so I, I, I don't know. I, I want to dig into that just more because there's something special that happened, or may, you know, in in the in the midst of a crisis that allows you to do all three, right? You, I think that's what you said, is that no, what we learned is you can get all three, and I kind of want to like, so so why did it take this? Or maybe it's because. The quality of you know the, the the research that you do that has advanced so quickly you know in advanced manufacturing and 3D printing and all the you know and maybe that's the the secret sauce to ultimately be able to get all three. Can you say more about that? Because I mean, right? The, for 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 hundreds of years, people have said you can't get all three, and now you're saying you can get all three. And what's the special sauce to that? Sure, and and I think actually it, it's. It's more so that there's an added dimension of immediacy, and 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 uh, uh, maybe it's pick three instead of pick three out of four instead of two out of three. So if you wanna if you wanna actually satisfy something immediately, you're gonna have to trade off something in whatever you're working in. I think we work with constrained design, constrained optimization, and everything we do as engineers. Um, and in manufacturing, uh, part of the way we looked at these problems, each of these problems, is. We have a set of capabilities, whether they be processes, materials, or people, uh, and then we, we say, okay, what can we do and solve within this time horizon? And then what is the volume of that need in this time horizon so that we can schedule our designs in a way that they can satisfy all of those different needs? Uh, it just so happened that we came up on a design that uh, I think satisfied that particular need, both in the order of thousands in one week to millions in three weeks. Um, 
and I think uh, uh, maybe one way I'd look at it to answer your question would be, uh, in this case, it isn't fully about what is the best design that's out there. What is your minimum viable product that you can get out there that will make a difference? And I remember mentioning that term to, um, to one of the doctors, and they were like, absolutely. We need something that's not the best thing out there, mm -hmm. but it's something that will, will get the job done for the level of the problem that we have. So um, maybe the relax, relaxation of constraints comes in uh, the design in that sense, but we, of course, have to obviously take into consideration all the needs of various stakeholders, like in this case, healthcare mm -hmm. workers. So, um, you know, one of the things, we've talked about the local impact um, of the work that you're doing, but I'll bet that it has, has global impact. And, you know, for the face shields, it, it has a low cost aspect that might be scalable to economies that, um, um, that can't afford, uh, you know, expensive products. Sam, can you talk a little bit about either that or other things that we're working on uh, that have a global impact, maybe because they are a lower cost? I would say that one of the things we tried to do in terms of designing a lot of these uh, products is making sure that it would work here as well as work at other places of the world. So, you know, you look at the um, the issue of ventilators, you know, people are saying that there are certain areas of the world that are going to be uh, low in terms of the number of ventilators compared to the demand. And so we have professors like Shannon Yee and Devesh Ranjan that have taken bag valve masked ventilators. And so these are uh, what you typically see on an ambulance. They're, they're the bag that you may see uh, medical personnel pushing with their hands to uh, basically give air to a patient. And the issue that you see there is that someone has to squeeze that bag manually. And so what some of our teams have done is taken uh, a ventilator based on those bags and actually taken a mechanical uh, motor to actually squeeze those bags. So someone doesn't have to do that manually. And so one of the designs that uh, was developed by Shannon Yi is uh, able to take two of those ventilators, uh, provide uh, sufficient airflow for, for a patient, but then also it has uh, just basically a simple motor that can run off of a 12 volt battery. And so that was done specifically so that you could have this uh, ventilator run for hours without being plugged into the wall. And so this very simple ventilator could be uh, mass produced it could be used here in the U.S. for, uh, I think the target range is around $100 to $150, and that, that range to, to build it. And it could also be used in third world, world countries or developing nations. And so the I here is to say, you know, how can we take these simple ventilators and get them to the areas of the greatest need with uh, as little cost as possible? And so I think um, uh, the groups have done a magnificent job in terms of looking at uh, not just what is needed locally, but what may be needed in, in other countries that may not have the infrastructure that we have here in the U.S. Uh, to treat medical um, conditions. And so I, I think um, uh, one thing that you will see is that in order to manufacture this, just the same way we talked about the face shield, very, very simple designs, very, very simple to cut out, very simple and easy to uh, assemble. And that uh, that's something that could fold up in a very nice flat pack in a small bag and be assembled at location very, very easily. You know, and that brings up, uh, because as soon as you start talking about ventilators, you know, I think a lot of people think of, I don't know, I don't know how much the sophisticated ones that you've been seeing on TV, probably thousands of dollars, and now you're talking about about $100, and, the, and it comes back to the face shields as well, and I was, throughout the whole process, I've been thinking about, you know, what kind of approvals are needed to actually, you know, be able to use equipment. I think, and, and Chris, you, you didn't mention at all, hey, the face shields need some kind of approval by a government authority in order to use them, and I assume that that's the case. And it, but whereas the ventilators do, and I wonder how, is, is there a natural tendency among your, your thinking to kind of avoid the need to, you know, seek approval and get it out? Or, you know, how, does, how do we fold that whole, because again, we're not, Georgia Tech engineers aren't typically in the business of seeking FDA approval for the work that we do, and that's a really involved process. Um, how, how's that, that, that kind of, um, you know, that's an added dimension to the work that you're gonna do, and has that steered you away from certain things, or has it drawn you towards other things? Yeah, I'll, I'll add one thing, and then I think Sam can talk about the ventilator, but on the face shields and intubation boxes, um, yeah, it's, it's interesting. You know, these are typically medical devices that fall under FDA's regulations, but uh, I think it was in the beginning of April, 
there was a um, there was a note sent out because of the the need was so large and we were so far behind the curve as a country in terms of PPE. They relaxed some of the existing uh, regulations on face shields, for example. Um, I think aside from that, there, you know, when we were doing the first prototyping of the face shield, I, I'd gone to Joanne Fabrics in Decatur, kind of near where I live, and and I started like looking for materials to prototype with Velcro, elastic, and things like that. And you know what I came across was like four or five Emory nurses, and there was right beside Decatur over there. Putting, to the, putting together their own face masks. Uh, and huh. it, it, that, the problem was so large that you know, we have people making their own things. Um, we got connected with various clinicians where we're bringing PPE to their houses, and they, they got wind that we're working on intubation boxes. They want those in the hospitals right away to trial with. And, and they know that, that they have to trial these as prototypes. They're not approved FDA devices. But the need is so great, and the, um, the risks are so significant right now to the healthcare worker that they'll work with those prototypes to make sure that they understand, you know, how it can be used inside the, um, inside the uh, hospital correctly. Um, so it's, it's those kinds of challenges even on uh, what we might think of as fairly sim simple devices that are going to make a huge impact for the healthcare worker. So um, on the ventilator side, I think Sam has a better understanding of where the regulations are on, on that. So I'll quickly say that the, the FDA plays a very important role um, as we develop technologies that could be used to help patients or help doctors. The FDA puts in regulations to make sure that we don't introduce something into the hospital that later on has an unintended consequence that could either harm the doctor or harm the patient. So as responsible engineers, we always want to abide by uh, getting approval so that we don't do something unintentional. And so with the face shields, we did uh, check with the FDA through our partners, which is the Global Center, Global Center for Medical Innovation. And so we did a check with the FDA to make sure that those face shields could be used under the current exclusion. Um, with the intubation boxes, we are currently talking with them about that as well. And the ventilators, because that is going in, uh, especially in terms of a life-saving application to help a patient breathe, that is a very clear one that we need to have some sort of a regulatory approval and so again, working with GCMI, we are in the process of submitting applications to make sure that our current technologies meet FDA approval. Uh, what is really good is that there are a few other universities, I believe University of Minnesota has a bag valve mask ventilator that does have FDA approval. So there's precedent out there that these typical devices or these kinds of devices can meet the stringent demands of what the FDA, FDA puts into place to make sure that patients are safe. And so we're following up with that through uh, GCMI. Chris, you know, one of the things we always do um, on the podcast is ask how you found your way to engineering. Um, you know, a lot of kids, uh, when they're younger, they tinker or, you know, you know, or have a parent or something. And how, how, did, you, how did you find your way to uh, engineering? So, uh, yeah, so it's, uh, uh, you know, if I remember back my days in high school, the uh, thing that got me interested in, in mechanical engineering and manufacturing in general uh, really was I was involved in shop. Uh, so you, you might, might be involved in an automotive shop or in, in a, a theater, like putting together um, various kinds of uh, things in high school with your hands. Uh, so that got me really interested in engineering and in particular the mechanical engineering curriculum. Uh, and I remember when I got into my undergraduate uh, degree and started focusing on manufacturing. I remember uh, uh, people telling me that manufacturing, it was around 2000, 2000, right around that time when China was really starting to crank up manufacturing at the time. And they said, you know, a lot of manufacturing is going to China. It's not really going to be really critical here in the United States. But I think it's situations like what we see here with COVID and um, the, the rise of maker spaces on campuses such as ours that um, really place an emphasis on manufacturing here in the United States and high tech manufacturing. So. Uh, it's something when I look back that I'm glad I stuck with it all those times. Some people were telling me to get out of it because it's something where you look at companies like Apple, Tesla, SpaceX, they're looking for manufacturing engineers right now. And a lot of them come here to Georgia Tech to recruit our students because they're, um, you know, really good and obviously have the great resources here in the Flowers Invention Studio and all our other spaces that are focused on making uh, for them to get familiar with those areas. And how about you, Sam? How did you find your way to uh, engineering, studying in engineering? So um, engineering, I'm not sure that uh, it was a, a direct path, but one of the things I'll say is that my, my parents, uh, they were in the military, and so I saw a lot of military equipment growing up, and 
I used to love watching helicopters and airplanes. I had this curiosity about how they worked. And, you know, the every day, every year, the uh, the military bases would have these open houses and you could crawl through the equipment to see you know, what they look like. And so, so uh, I just had this natural curiosity. And one of the things that I will say is that um, there was another important piece to this besides, you know, just crawling around and seeing what we could find on the military bases when, when my dad was in the army was that uh, I'm a first generation college student. And so my parents didn't go to college. I didn't know another engineer. I didn't know anything about engineering until I was in ninth grade. And uh, the local uh, college had an engineering summer camp and I knew that they were working on cars. And so I said, well, let me go do that. And so by starting to go to some, going to summer camps uh, for engineering, starting in the ninth grade, that kind of led me down that that rabbit hole of, OK, I think this is what I want to do. And so for, for the universities that are out there doing outreach, I think is very important. And for younger people, if you don't really know what you want to do, try these things out. You know, come to our, our campuses, visit during the school year, visit during the summer, spend some time with us. And you may find a, a version of engineering or a version of innovation uh, that, that you don't know exists right now. But we, we may find a way of connecting with you and sparking some some fire that you end up, you know, working on later on in your career. Well, um, I'm going to let you all get back. Um, I know you're extraordinarily busy and I can't tell you how much we appreciate your time for coming in and talking to us um, on this podcast. You know, I'm one of the luckiest people around because I get to see all kinds of amazing ideas. Um, it's so much fun to see really capable people doing really great stuff. But I think you both have taken that to a whole other level. I know our whole community is extraordinarily proud of everything you're doing. Just can't can't thank you enough for all the time and energy you, you put into uh, to helping the community. You uh, make all of us at Georgia Tech very proud. So thank you guys very much. Thank you. And uh, thank you to Georgia Tech and, and especially your office for uh, for giving this opportunity. Take care, guys. Thanks. See ya.